I know you can, and I think there are, I think unfortunately, there are very few people in our field that can actually explain normal movement. We can explain poses, we can explain you know, stretches, but we, we don't have that many people that can explain just movement. <laughs> So um, I'd like to introduce James Earls. Um, I don't even know where to start with James Earls because uh, we go back a long way. I think it's about 20 years. And um, a lot of people will recognize James for, and this is the first edition, Born to Walk book. And um, that really, uh, I think, is one of the best covers I've ever seen in the days of modern sort of uh, movement and anatomy books because it's such. It's the sort of thing I would have loved to design myself at some point because there's a beautiful piece of design work. And, and, and you're on your second edition of this now, haven't you? Just yes. Like yeah, and we kept, we kept the same cover because we, we, everyone liked it so much that we just thought, no, we can't, we can't lose it. It's got so much style to it. It's certainly coming from a designer. I just I love it so much. So um, yeah, well done yeah. on that. Um, but, um, you know, I met James um, through Tom Myers. You know, we, we both appeared on the same... In those days, KMI training in Boston and um, in, in uh, where was it? Sulu. Andover. Andover, yeah. Sulu. Sulu. Yeah, that's right. And I actually, I loved every minute of being there. It was such a great move in my life to go there. And um, in those days, before I'd met James, uh, we used to host Tom Myers at uh, my natural body studios in Brighton in the, in the late 90s. And Tom was then considering bringing um, anatomy trains and his structure integration school to the UK. And uh, me innocently figured that, oh, yeah, I knew how to do that and bring it across. But um, I was still in the throes of trying to figure out what it took to run a studio. And I had a studio in a warehouse then. And yeah. um, I remember Tom saying to me, we can't do that in that warehouse because it's just it's got ropey old entranceway. And Tom, Tom doesn't mix his words. And I used to like that. But then we got into a bigger studio and it was great and we had lots of anatomy trains courses there. And, um, but I think at one point, you know, Tom was also talking about somebody called James Earls who had his, his school of massage in Ireland and Ultimate Massage Solutions was the school. Um, and of course, when it came to my uh, immaturity of trying to manage a course like, um, uh, like Tom's, James was the perfect person to, to, for Tom to place it with. And, I always I say this to Tom every time is that you've made the right move going with James because I never would have been able to do that and the way that you did it your your character your elegance and the way that you work with Tom it was the perfect person for that job and I would still say still today would be the perfect person for that job as well you know it hadn't you know if things hadn't changed I understand that and yeah hats off to that huge respect and I know sometimes we had a few little you know, head to head moments where I've been a little bit stupid and things I've said in the past, but um, I've, I've loved where you've come from and watched that grow all the way through. So, um, James Earls, I'd just like to say hi and um, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I do have, I have some fond memories of Sue Luby's studio and uh, what came to mind was, so you just said Tom was maybe a little fussy on choice of venue. Do you remember getting locked in to one corner every Wednesday afternoon where we had to bunch up and we weren't allowed to escape? We weren't allowed to go we to make coffee, we couldn't go to the toilet, we were just kind of locked in because there was a class next door on the other side of the curtain. People had to sleep, do you remember? Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the, yes, that was a few years ago, yeah, so 20 years ago. So yeah, um, that's how we met. Um, I think I started teaching then with Tom um, in around 2005, 2006. Right. And then we, we ran the KMI training um, from 2007. I think the first one was 2007. And um, a few people that are, that are still around um, teaching and, and practicing Don Thompson. Yeah. Zita, I think, was a, a model at that time. Fee, Fee Pamela is now teaching. Uh, Ruth Duncan was in the first one, uh, part one and part two. Um, so there's quite a few kind of familiar names that came out of that, that training as well. Uh, yeah, cool. Good. So James, what, I mean, what got you to kind of look into Tom's work? Um, how did that come about for you? 
that can, I think like many, many people at that time had been subscribing to massage, the massage magazine, American massage magazine that went through a few ebbs and, ebbs and flows of um, quality and lack of. Um, at that time it was, so I started subscribing probably 96, 95, 96, because it was the only source of reasonable bodywork information. I had trained in aromatherapy early 90s. Uh, there were three books that were available on, on massage, Claire Maxwell Hudson, and another book that was exactly the same, 16 Ways to Effleurage, and Leon Chateau's soft tissue manipulation that just went over everyone's head. It was, and there was nothing in, in between. Mm. Um, and the market was so much better established, and the, the standards higher than SAS um, training market. And so I sort of subscribed to their, their magazine, and it was the October, November 1997 edition, I popped through the letterbox, and I flicked through, and there was an article called Understanding the Feet. And I thought, I also studied reflexology, so I thought as a reflexologist, I should understand the foot. So I read it, and it was the first time somebody had explained anatomy rather than taught it. Yeah. And looking at the architecture of the bones and the, the ligaments and the angles of the, the tendons across the joints and stuff. And I was like, oh, wow. Anatomy actually kind of, there's a certain logic to it and kind of makes sense when you put it all together and kind of tell it like a story rather than just go A, B, A, D equals U that this. Um, and that was thankfully, it was the first in Tom's series of articles and um, called, well, it's not kind of bundled together, it's body cute. And so that was the first time I came across Thomas Myers. Um, the series articles is built up through, so I think it was the, the fans and the hip was the next and into the, into the spine. Um, and 1999, uh, same magazine, and there was an advert saying Tom was coming to Dublin uh, to train, or uh, so to teach uh, anatomy trains. I thought, I have no idea what the hell anatomy trains was then. He hadn't published uh, at that stage. And um, I went on to, uh, I think it was the Clontorf Castle, so I stayed there just six months ago over um, Christmas. And hmm. um, it's Christmas six months or like uh, three years ago, I don't know. Uh, but I stayed there. And Tom uh, was presenting, he was, he was hosted by uh, John Sharkey. Um, and Tom presented at the end of three days, I thought, I still have no idea really what this anatomy train thing is, but I, like, I saw the overall kind of picture of like that, that makes sense. Um, and you know, I liked his style of kind of explaining that to me. Obviously, the detail was above and beyond anything I'd come across before. Um, and then it was just, I think, probably the, the next week or the next month, uh, I, I signed up for the, the, the training that we did. Started commuting between Belfast and Boston, hence the slightly odd accent I'm reading from just south of Belfast. <laughs> so the certain words I'll say are a bit strange. <laughs> Yeah, I remember those days of, um, it was almost monthly, wasn't it, having to go out there at some point. Yeah, yeah it was two weeks on, kind of two weeks off, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, I mean, for us travelling from the UK, uh, it, was, it was quite, yeah, we had to put our lives on hold, reorganise everything, and I remember I just moved into that new studio and had to reschedule everything to fit. Um, mm -hmm. It was exciting to do, it was really exciting to do. It was, yeah. um, and it created kind of a pot boiler kind of atmosphere. It's just everyone, everyone's going kind of going through it. It's a totally different, but a, a similar kind of chaos. It's not. It's like you know, four was it almost a six month kind of process. And um, it's like life has been held by this thing that we're going through. And um, so, yeah, relationships, businesses, travel. Well, we were traveling, but it was all kind of contained into the, that, that kind of one, one process. So a lot of changes came out of it. Um, um, in terms of the structural integration, you know, from, from your massage therapy that you were doing and everything else, did you, did you just make the sudden switch or did you find that you were meandering between the two? Um, I had to meander between the two. I think um, I don't know, kind of it's, a, it's an issue that kind of comes up, up, up every so often with the, the students as well. Um, my, explanation for having to do that was I think in the UK especially maybe less so in, in Europe we had much less of a the wider population much less of a sense of the ideas of around transformative bodywork what, what is it and um, most of us most of the general population have a 
kind of almost like a physiotherapy idea of massage therapy. So yeah. I have an ache and a pain, I have a stiffness, I will turn up, you'll fix me, and you know, I'll see you next time it happens, rather than seeing it as a process. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think most of the, the, the people who went through the training in the UK had to, you know, just to, to make a living, still have some kind of combination um, within the, the, the treatment. Um, so I, I stayed with a kind of a, a science therapy, structure integration kind of blend, mix. Um, and, you know, both informed the other. And so sometimes, you know, just thinking back to the actual practice, sometimes I, you know, I, I don't know what the heck I was doing. It was, you know, with, you know the, 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 the treatment just became what, what I thought it needed. So was it structural integration? Was it was it science therapy? I don't know. I was just trying trying to do my best with whatever tools and understanding I had at the time. Yeah. Did you find that? I mean, because I I found this that I wasn't putting everyone through the series. I was using elements of that work in some sessions, but not the whole series sometimes. And it yeah. I mean that you know there could have been foot and leg work that was required, and and that might have been you know fifteen sessions worth of that until something kind of shifted and from. That person was on their way, and it didn't. It almost did the rest of the work for them. Yep. It was. Yeah. Let me question the structural integration a lot when that started happening. Yeah, and you know, the the conversation is on kind of I think ongoing. Um, it's what's the what's the value of the kind of the, the strict ten or twelve or eleven session series? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, the, it's commonly quoted to on this side. I might vary or wander away from the recipe, but I always know where I am in relationship to it. Yes. Um, and I think that's uh, a lot of the older time kind of structural ther integration therapists would really kind of say that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it would make me question, it's like, well, where are they with their practice, even though the, some of them hold very strongly to the, to the rigor of the, the series? It's like, well, is it still recognizably mm. what you know what you would have been taught as the as the framework? So I think many people do wander from yeah. the, the the rigor. Um, and I might in kind of very simplistic kind of summary, I think it's it's like day one massage training. It's like we will teach you the sequence and for no particular reason other than there's a certain logic to it. But it means that it's a it's a vehicle for your learning, yeah. So that you can master the tools. And once you've got them, then you can make up any kind of random, kind of well, hopefully not random, but <laughs> um, individualized treatment program appropriate to your client's needs. Yeah, because you know, we, I mean, at those days, we had to have the series done before we arrived. Mm -hmm. So, and there were no PMI practitioners. It was rolfers that we had to find. Yep. So I went through that rolfing experience and. That was that. That was so different to, to experiencing what I experienced in receiving KMI work. Yep. Very different experience. I remember thinking I was part of me was searching for the feel of what happened to me in Rolfing, whilst I was going. You know, my my partner William Broder. Remember hmm, that famous thing about him eating crisps when you asking him to eat raisins. <laughs> it was so noisy. Um, but yeah, he. Uh, but also, he'd come from a rolfing training, and he'd come from the guild of structural integration, you know. Um, yeah. And I think what Tom wanted him to do was to try and find a way to soften up the touch rather than going so aggressively. Mm -hmm. So the, the point in which I was was um, touched in the rolfing was was such a sweet point. There's Prue. Um, I can't remember her second name now, but she was someone that Tom had trained yeah. in Lewis at the time. Yeah, it was great. You know, it was really, really quite profound the process, and it was. It was delicate, but the considered enough, enough work on the body and then enough work off the body. And the thing that shocked me with this was the amount of time off the body. Mm -hmm. Do you remember David, Tom's friend at the time, had filmed yes. some of Tom's sessions? And when we yes, played the surfer him, dude. That's right, yeah. He, uh, Dave Kennedy, that's right. He um, filmed one of the sessions of Tom working on one of the, his models. And then when David, he, what he did, he edited it down to Tom's hands on time. And in that 90 minutes of the session, the hands on time was 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that was a real learning for me. Yeah. You know, 90 minutes of constant hands on work would probably send someone over the edge. Yeah. It was, that was quite, quite yeah, there's a, 
so one of the people that um, came in, I actually, so Lou Benson, who was um, assisted through our training, but then went off and, and uh, studied a lot with Judith Aston, then recently in the last, I think, five or six years, has come back to talk about uh, titration and the compound interest of time. Yes. Um, I think that was a, a wonderful quality that I think she really embedded from or brought in from the, the Aston work. Yeah. Um, because in the, so in the KMI training process, there would seem to be a strong emphasis in the, the biomechanics and the biomechanics of a stroke and yeah. the intention behind the stroke to an anatomy um, much more than I think eventually we, we tend to mature into that kind of softer, more appreciative, more um, holding and quiet time um, space where it's like, okay, well, let's see what the body can do and we'll, we'll give it information rather than um, inform it. Yeah. In, and there's a, there's a um, close kind of tipping point between informing and imposing. I think I, you know, I, I received massage in the same way. Yeah. You know, there, there is massage that goes with and works with one's tissue and there's massage that's just, and, and, and you know, in, in the other extreme, a, a, a horrible imposition where it's just like, just leave. What, what, yeah. Why are we even trying to make a living out of doing this? Yeah. Um, and it's, this is by no means an, an attack in, in any way on the truth. I think every yoga, science therapy, reflexology, whatever. You know, there, there has to be a, a process where we mature and we, we refine the techniques. You know, the carpentry is the same. You can't produce, you know, fantastic cabinets, you know, after your two weeks of apprenticeship. <laughs> Going to mess a few things up. I remember watching Lou. I mean, it was it would be an unforgettable. It's still in my mind. I can still see Lou working on her models in those early days, and um, it was like watching a dance being performed in front of you. Mm -hmm. you know, and you could see, you could tell by looking at Lou's eyes and face, you knew where she was on someone's body without looking at her hand by the way she was manoeuvring. And I think she's probably one of the most exquisite body workers I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, um, I learned so much just by watching her. It was quite incredible. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that she's kind of back in that place again with Tom School because it was such a unique blend of actually Michael, Tom, and, and Lou at that time because Michael was really quite something. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And what he's doing now, he sort of disappeared off the map, I think. I don't know who he is. Yeah, I, he went on to Florida, disappeared, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, shame. But um, so from that, you know, the, the structure integration work, you, you kind of, of course, you were then educating with Tom and then running the Anatomy Trains UK. So you, you were busy at one point. I mean, I just did see you, you're just, you weren't at home, you were everywhere. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, that's, that's a, there's a lot of learning experience by working with so many people, teaching so many strokes, as it were, and stuff like that. But um, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, you, you started to take a different interest, and you wrote that other book with Tom, which is the um, uh, sure the balance. The balance. I'm looking over there because it's on my yeah. shelf, yeah. Um, <clears throat> which I think is really great as well, because it was a nice manual to kind of review the work. Yeah. And for us, you know, KMI people, there wasn't really a manual in a well, way than those strange pages we got in up yeah. you know, but that's uh, why i wrote it it was it was out of frustration but there was no manual it was like well why don't we write a manual and why don't we make a book mm. uh, so that's that's where that came from and yeah. um, so then yeah they slightly different direction and this is a strong memory um, from yourself and a number of other yoga movement pilates teachers that were in uh, the original KMI training will be quite regular conversation of Tom why would we keep doing all of this manual work and um, because it's kind of we could do the same thing with a bit of movement a bit of stretch a bit of whatever mobilization um, why do we have to keep getting people on the table whenever actually our goal is to make them more successful in the real world where they're in gravity and actually moving rather than having something impose implied yeah. on them. I, I found, um, sorry, to right? I found that, um, you know, because coming from a movement background originally, and then I was trained in shatsu and cranial sacral work, is that all my work was on the floor, even my cranial work I did on the floor. So there was that one time when we were at Sulu's and there were no more tables left, and I had to do it on the floor. 
And I said, oh, but Tom, I haven't got a table. And he, he looked at me and I said, I'm so used to doing chat, so I can do it on the floor. And he very cockily said, well, what, why do you think it's called integration? And it was, you know, integrate. And then I got, oh, integrating other systems as well, other ways. And, but I remember trying out the series on people on the floor, moving them. So I would have them move whilst I would sort of pin tissue and then move them rather than just have them static. And at one point, I just decided to give it a go. And I tried the series cranially, mm -hmm. even though it couldn't get to some of the deep structures, but I just played around with the intent of that. But um, that was really quite profound because there were similar kind of results coming up. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had them go through the series by moving only. So I would just sit back and guide them through the movements. Yeah. And then I just thought, well, I'm, I don't always need to put my hands on it. No. I think um, perhaps structural integration is, is sometimes seen too much as kind of it, it's, it's body work. It's the application sometimes of quite strong technique. I don't, I think that's, that's, a, that's a misunderstanding. I think it's actually a series of 10 to 12 sessions with certain goals for each session. And I think if you stick to the goals for each session, and there's a kind of general logic to the order, yeah. but not necessarily fitting for everybody, but you know, there's, a, there's a logic there. If you, it doesn't, does it matter how you achieve those goals? Does it matter how you open the foot and get it more adaptable, get it in better alignment? Does it matter how you open the breath? Like, well, you know, makes sense, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Um, you were saying you, you talked to, to Stephen Braybrook um, yesterday, and um, you know, why? Why does it have to be hands-on? Why does it have to be movement? Why? You know, why not cue the eyes, cue the tongue, cue, cue all of the the neurology? I think one of the problems, perhaps, we have as a as a wider profession is we, we're so encamped. It's like my way. My way is the the, the true way. My way is the better way. You know, those ex practitioners don't know what they're doing they, they they work too hard they work too lightly they you know they they leave the room for five minutes come in twiddle for two and bugger off it's like and they get paid you know they, we have so many stories about the other uh, yeah it's like, well, if it if it didn't work it wouldn't be still on the market exactly and there are many ways to achieve the goals mm -hmm. I, mean, I think we're we're beginning to get a better vocabulary for the understanding of the, the complexity of our, our system. You know, I fully kind of put my hands up and, and for responsibility of uh, being partly responsible for kind of the, the, the fascia thing um, like it, and realizing it's not all about the bloody fascia. Um, it's well, about one, one portion, one small important element for the. Yeah, there's the neurology, the, the muscle, the skeletal system, the you know, keep on going, and all of the interactions, the emotions. Good name for a workshop and a book. It's not all about the bloody fascia. <laughs> well, it's kind of a subtitle for it. I'm giving a, 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 another webinar called The Use of Soft Tissue, and, and within that, there is one, 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 one slide with the t that as the title. It's not, some of it is about the bloody fascia, yeah. but it's not all. I um, well then because Tom was over, I think um, at Tri Yoga a couple of years ago. I think we'd met at Guinness. James and I like uh, Guinness, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'd met. I knew Tom was coming over, and he was teaching at Tri Yoga, and he was doing four days or something. And I was booked to teach for two days after that, about a week later. And I, I my my promotional was um, fascia is useless. Dot 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 like that. And I. I left it like that, but in the blurb, it was just talking about the reasons why I would say that. But I got a lot of questions. Why are you saying that? You're a person that teaches about that. I said, well, it is if you take everything away. It's, it's completely integrated with everything else and depends upon everything else for it to function. It can't, it, it's, it's just like that on its own and does not, it can't go anywhere. Yeah. You know, it needs so much with it. So it's interesting that, you know, and as you know, it's, and you mentioned this in your book, it's, it's got its rightful place now. Can we kind of leave it there <laughs> and mm -hmm. then work with everything else knowing that it's incorporated into it? Yeah, yeah I think I'm hoping we, we can come to a more mature understanding yeah. and an appreciation with the, an appreciation of the complexity of the human body. We, I hope we can have a more, more human understanding and acknowledgement of the, the other modalities yeah. and, and get out of our, our little tightly held camps. So James, what then got you going down the route that you've ended up with 
where you, you know, because movement has really started to, right, you've always moved, I know, and I know you're primarily as a practitioner, you're a massage person, but, um, you know, you've had a keen eye for movement anyway, somewhere in there, and, you know, of course you've had a, a, a kind of a, a long interface with Pilates now and your partner as well, your wife, sorry. Um, but what got you interested in going down to the foot end of that and then kind of increasing that to whole body or foot and whole body together? You know, something's come yeah. about that you went, aha, what, what did that to you? Yep, yeah. um, that was partly out of teaching uh, anatomy twins and this was way back in 20, kind of through 2010, 2011, um, where I was teaching a workshop and you know, this is the story that has stuck in my head. I'm sure that the truth is a little bit looser, but um, I was teaching a workshop and somebody said, I said something, somebody said, that sounds like something Gary Gray would say. I went, who? And we had a conversation and moved swiftly on. And the next weekend I was teaching another workshop somewhere else and I said something and somebody put it up behind and said, that sounds like something Gary Gray would say. And we had a conversation, I thought, that's vaguely familiar. And the, the next weekend, it could have been you know, two months later, but it was three mentions within a relatively short time. Hmm. I thought, oh, so, you know, it was, it was a, a trip. So I remember going back to the hotel room and kind of Googling, just like, who the hell is Gary Gray? And all of this stuff came up. And the so-called father of function, American physical therapist, who um, has been teaching functional movement for the last... 30, 40 years, um, him and his psychic David Rio, right? Doctor of physical. And they were teaching a, a workshop they called Chain Reaction uh, in San Diego on a weekend I wasn't teaching. I thought, never been to San Diego. So I got on a, on a, on a train, I got on a plane, went over, and I sat in a workshop for three, three days. And the first day, I found myself getting ang angry, is maybe too strong, but. but Confused, perhaps. Strongly they, confused. Sorry. Strongly confused. Strongly confused. Because they they wouldn't show up by the bloody skeleton. It's like when the bone does this, the joint does that. The bone, the joint, the bone, the joint, the bone, the joint. So there's, this is so typical physical therapy. And mm. um, it's like don't they don't they know? It's not about the bones. It's all about the fascia. And um, and. I mentioned come from Belfast, so I, I did a, a years, two years voluntary work at a peace and reconciliation centre. And one of the one of the the red flags in prejudice reduction work is when you when you find yourself pointing the finger at somebody else and accusing them of something, it's actually an indication to maybe point it back at yourself. Um, so I think after the second or third pint of Guinness that night. Um, I started pint, pointing it, back, pointing it back. Yeah, <laughs> pointing it back at myself, thinking, "Oh, there's there's something in this." Um, and I went in the next day and started listening to their story and what they were calling about the, the chain reaction. And um, it's like, "Oh, actually, whenever you make this movement, I started seeing that actually these long chain patterns kind of fitted the the anatomy dreams and my actual continuities." As I saw at, at that time, it's like, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could kind of blend those two stories together? And uh, kind of the, the myofascially biased story, the skeletally biomechanically biased story, because they kind of fit. And it makes absolute sense when you, you know, it's, it seems like such a, a simple thing, but it's like, if there's a joint movement available, there has to be a soft tissue to control it. So if you have a long chain available movement, there has to be a long chain of soft tissue to control it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, nobody's actually, I haven't heard it mm -hmm. said that way. It's like, well, whenever we look at the patterns and you know, my, I teach workshops, I don't want to walk workshops, but I would say, I actually don't, I actually don't really care that much about walking. The, I do care about walking. But in the workshop, that's not the, the intention. It's all, you know, gait assessment is not the intention. The intention is, can I, can I build a vocabulary to help me see movement in a way that I can assess it and intervene, intervene with it? It's really interesting you say that because um, 
talking to Julian yesterday, and these are conversations I have with Stephen Braybrook over coffees in Brighton. Um, yeah. People around us would think these two guys are idiots. <laughs> but um, there isn't a language, anatomy language of movement. You know, we, we read most anatomy books and it's all in the, you know, of course it's in the anatomical plane because it's been broken down to such a degree that you see something like that and of course you expect that. Yeah. I say this in my courses jokingly, if, uh, whoever does that with a bicep, you know, if, I, if, if that was my coffee cup and I did that with a bicep, it goes over my shoulder very quickly. There's a whole series of other actions that are happening there, mm -hmm. but no one describes an anatomy of motion that is whilst it's moving, because, you know, deltoid means delta. It doesn't tell you about movement. It just means triangular shape. No. That, what does that describe? You know, yeah. I'm so I, again, it's part of the, the, the theme of the lecture I'm about to do. Um, I was thinking we, we've gone in the wrong direction. Yeah. We've gone from let's cut up the body and let's write up the books and let's kind of invent names and terms that don't necessarily explain everything or are totally con not contradictory, but they, it's like, do we call it a deltoid or do we use so by by shape, or do we say levator scapula by function, or do we call it tibialis anterior by position? Mm -hmm. So is it, you know, we, we just don't have any kind of standard terminology. The, the whole freaking thing is confused. Okay. And then we'll teach everyone these idealized, open chain, out of gravity, non-resistant actions, and then keep throwing that at you until eventually you think that you know it. Oh. But if we hadn't gone from, let's look at movement, Let's look at what happens when I do this. And then let's look at the anatomy. I think we would have had a much more connected yeah, sense of the anatomy yeah. and much more kind of the, the, the interactions. Yeah. Um, it's like, well, how does, how does this yeah. side flex my, you know, deltoid is a, is a spinal flexor. You know, it's an it's a inverter, everter of the ankles. Yeah. Um, so I think it's I'm very grateful to, to Gary Gray for kind of, hasn't necessarily created a new language, but certainly has created a, a school of thought that has, has enabled many other, many other schools and I'm one of them, some others kind of acknowledge that and some try to hide. We both see this when we work with someone and we watch them move and then you watch them move and you work with them whichever way we do and then you see them move and you know, this is, I think, a quote from Tom in a way, and it's that aha moment when you see them shift. It's like, well, what was it that did that? Because it wasn't, you know, just to be honest, posterior. You know, it was, it was a whole chain of events that just came together in that person's understanding and it went together fluidly. And there it is. Um, you know, what is the there it is? You know, and then it's theirs. It's got nothing to do with us. It's theirs. And they live into it and can they carry on from there? You know, it's, um, and I, I, I'm kind of I'm with it and I'm not sometimes where I kind of think maybe it would do it a disservice to start naming that thing because I've seen this in um, and you know I used to teach at Middlesex University and I used to teach on the third science degree course but it's a three-year degree course I would be in year two so I come in with this view of anatomy they basic anatomy year one so what they used to do is they would come in, so I'd be, I would insist on seeing them in the first two weeks of that first year and just watch them move, observe them in their rehearsals and stuff like that. And they're young, they're off the streets and they're fluid and expressive. And then I see them at the beginning of year two because they've learned basic anatomy, mechanical stuff, levers. All of a sudden that expression's gone. Yep. So what we do is we just take that stuff and throw it all up in the air and see how it lands. And exactly like you said, we play with it in different ways. And then what we've got at the end of year two, they understand the basic anatomy, they're not wedded to it, and they yeah. can bend it into a movement feeling. And then they have that expression again, but with more maturity. Yeah. You know, and luckily, because there's only been two years, they're not wedded to the old anatomy, like it could be, you know, we've been teaching in the world of fascial anatomy to old massage therapists that are so wedded to the old anatomy they're scared to let it go. <laughs> yeah, I, I went for this years ago, uh, I was involved with the teaching in aromatherapy and I invited a teacher of chemistry to come over and he was, was a chemist, trained in aromatherapy and then kind of because he had, he had the language, he was doing quite well teaching chemistry to aromatherapists. And I said, okay, well, I'll bring you over to Belfast. I said, but on, on one condition, he went, so what? I, went, I want you to teach backwards. Went, 
What do you mean? He said, I want you to start from the oil and then go to the chemistry right down into the molecule and the cationic and ionic or whatever the hell binding. Because every time that you teach chemistry, you start here. And I have no freaking idea of, of the relevance or the dynamic of chemical bonding and gradually building up to the, the, the families, the aldehydes and the alcohols and whatever. And so by the time you get to the aldehydes and alcohols, I've switched off and my brain is full. If you give me lavender and ask me what are the properties of lavender, I know the properties of lavender. I know the smell of lavender. Okay, so lavender is a, it's an antiseptic. Why is it an antiseptic? Because it's got alcohol. Can you smell the alcohol? I can smell the alcohol, of course. It's, it's Friday afternoon. I'm, yeah. um, so, and then take me down. Why is an alcohol antiseptic? Well, it's because it has this group of and then and then you get me to the cell and it's the same with anatomy it's like start with movement you know so you know, I, I did something for Plante's teachers it's like why not let's look at the repertoire let's look at what you do in that movement and then let's break it down you know so going back to the anatomy trains let's okay so in that position you're using the superficial front or back line yeah, I can see that. It's like, that's obvious. It's like, I've got you. It's like, you, you've got a vision of something anatomical in a movement. And then I can take you down to the bits. Yeah. And we can see the kind of the relevant irrelevance of the, the bits. Yeah. It's, it's only in context of the, the greater whole that they actually have some kind of deeper meaning. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, with a child moving the moment they're born, they don't start with their anatomy, they start with moving on the surface that they're on. And that's it, they're moving into space. You know, they're, they're assembling inside the womb, but they're not assembling anatomically. It's almost as if their anatomy has come last, because the muscles will develop their power and strength and fall shape by the time they've got to a certain size. Yep. And yet we've started at the bit that's last. Mm -hmm. And lots of people have forgotten about the skin. <laughs> yes. Yep. You know? Yeah, I, I found a, a wonderful paper um, just when I, for the, the second edition of the book. And we were saying about the elasticity, so the, the, the paper, I can't remember exactly the, the title, but the elasticity um, of the um, hip flexors, so in, in walking. And it was one of those fantastic kind of uh, made up uh, experiments where they they wanted to take the hip into extension and then let go so they could measure the kind of the passive elastic uh, recoil. So they just put somebody on the side and took their leg, put it on a hospital trolley so that they could take the leg back into um, extension and then just let go so they could measure then the, the elastic load. And the, the conclusions from the paper was um, going back and it was all the percentages, but it was the elastic energy of the skin, the adipose layer, so the epimesiums, the tendons, the whatever, every, from, everything from joint capsule to skin right. had a contribution. And again, it's that kind of, you know, it's like, is it all about the fascia? It's, you know, in, in those terms, it's all, it's any collagenous tissue has the ability for some elastic, elastic properties. That's yeah. kind of, that's why the, the second edition kind of moves away a little bit from just kind of the anatomy trains because it, it made it give the impression that it's just this single layer. It's, it's not, it's like it's everything that's being stretched. You know, do that with your finger. It's not, it's not the tendon, so it's, it's skin, adipose, whatever. Yeah. I mean, this um, John Sturt, who you know um, from Handspring, he's um, written the book, The Original Body. John has got, I've got it up here. It's called Structural Fitness. He wrote it in the seventies. And it's still profound today, but he absolutely disowns it because his, his meeting with Banda Scarabelli changed his way of thinking in terms of movement and practice. You know, being an osteopath and a yoga teacher, and he was influenced originally by Iyengar's work, and he was trained by Mr. Iyengar, but then had a complete about face when he met Banda. Iyengar was big on skin. And um, he, in those days, Iyengar was saying the skin is the outer surface of the brain. And he was taught that by his teacher. And yet we now know that, of course, through embryology and what have you, and it's part of what we get taught in embryology and structural work. But John has always been talking about skin in motion. And just recently, John's in his, in his 70s now, and he's got a lovely way of he's working so differently. But it's about let the skin permit the movement first. 
So if you can bring your attention to the skin, allow the skin to move you. And recently in dissection labs where there's been excess load in one area, the skin can be up to a centimetre thick in some parts. Because it's, it's responded like any other part. Yep. And it either limits or permits motion. Yeah, it's cool. I, I think that's, that's a wonderful uh, thing that's going to come out of, you know, that there's a trend is, is, is demeaning it, but there's a, a trend for the, the scar tissue work at the moment, just a, at least an appreciation um, of uh, the importance and the, the, the role and the, so the, the abilities of the, the skin. I think that that's going to be you know, a, a hopefully a, a another growth kind of area for our understanding and appreciation that you know, it has huge implications for movement, not just in that local area, but, but through the rest, of the, the rest of the body as well. It's really great to hear you say about um, the, you know, quoting you then is like, yeah, I don't care about walking. And of course you do, but it's the fact that you're not trying to get everyone to walk the same. You're, you're actually bringing about their abilities to express themselves through their pattern freely. Yep. Yeah. And, so, uh, Sorry, sorry, just to interrupt, there's um, at the fascia and the connective tissue and sports science event that was in Ulm University a few years ago. Yeah. Um, one of the speakers there, who I, I can't remember his position now, he's one of Robert Schweik's colleagues who's looked at the elements of gait, and he was saying that you know the problem with gait analysis is that everyone's being taught to walk the same, and you know that's not where you're coming from at all, is it? No, I am. So I'm, yeah, certainly not the kind of the cookie cutter imposition. Um, this is the way to walk. Um, I start with the question of how can, is there an inefficiency that I can see? Is there, a, is there a, an awkwardness, a, a glitch, a, a something? And can we smooth that out? Yeah. So I'm not, you know, again, I'm, I'm saying this quite, quite loosely. I'm not interested in pain at the moment. I'm just interested in inefficiency. Can I? Can I make, or can I make arrogance? Uh, can I, can we encourage your system to be as efficient as we currently can encourage your system to be? Yeah. Um, with a lot of kind of side benefits, then if you can move efficiently, well, we're loading the tissue hopefully as optimally as, as possible. Mm -hmm. Your um, enjoyment of movement is going to be greater. You're going to move more and you're going to have all of the benefits of moving more. You know, again, one of the, the side benefits of these seven weeks and the last seven weeks for many people is that they've actually got out and moved. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Like, you know, so um, I'm involved with a, a group of personal trainers that are, can meet every every week just on a Zoom. And for them it's it, you know, chaos in the, the first couple of weeks. It's like, oh my God, you know, we've lost all of our clients, all the gyms are closed. And even when we come out of lockdown, what's going to happen to the gyms? Mm. But actually, you know, as time has gone on and with other countries coming out, we're actually saying that actually the, the take up and the interest in movement is increasing. And um, somebody give the, the figure for um, apps for Apps have been growing at, I think it was 50% per year. And in the last three months, so they kind of you know, do it yourself, kind of yoga or um, hit exercises, they've increased 230% every week. I mean, that's huge. That's, that's, a, that's a huge, fantastic new market of people that are interested in movement. Yeah, I think it's gonna, it, it will, I think it's gonna change a lot of attitudes. Well, I would hope it will. I mean, let's see, you know, because Oh, I don't know. I mean, I know we're kind of quickly going on to our current situation, but, um, you know, it's been since January, really, in a way, um, until now. So we're, what, we're five months in, heading towards six months at some point. But if you think about, you know, like, a, like World War II was six years or so. So, you know, will this just disappear after another six months' time and people will start thinking differently and maybe all those good intentions and stuff. I mean, there's going to be an impression somewhere on the line, something shifted, but... I'm kind of intrigued with that, you know, yeah. what's going to happen. But the amount of people that come online now for things, it's, it's great because I think also the social aspect is a big part of what's going on. It's helping them feel connected to the world, even though it's like this. Yes. And they're moving at the same time, and they're all moving in their own little boxes that you see on the screen, but they're still doing something. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I think so. You mentioned my wife teaches Pilates when she's found so she re resisted for the first few weeks, not wanting to do kind of online Zoom stuff. And her client base is kind of split in kind of two, you know, there's everything in between, but there are two extremes of those who said, I, I can't wait to get back and be in the room and be, you know, one to one. And there are others that have gone, well, actually, I can get a similar workout. I'm getting it without the 30 minute each way, so one hour travel time. It's like that's, you know, all you know, I we both grew up in the seventies. I I want to go back and just wring some people's necks that were on tomorrow. Do you remember tomorrow's world? Yes. So I grew up with the promise that oh, whatever you're, you know, in another twenty years we're going to have all of these labor saving devices. Life is going to be so easy. And it's like what if, what happened? It's like it's not easy. What happened all the time that we're going to get? Yeah, I think. <laughs> So I think one benefit is actually we're getting more used to we are saving a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I haven't obviously haven't flown for eight weeks. And I'm liking that. I'm liking that for myself, I'm liking it for the planet, I'm liking that for my wife. You know, it's like it's, there are so many benefits. I'm like, okay, um, after being a resistor for so long, it's like online education is you know going to be seriously to be mixed efficiently with what we do in a room. It would halve our time in the room. We'd still be there, but you know, I've noticed this with my courses. If I'm in Sweden, I don't need to be there all that time. I can do half of it from here, half of it there. You know, so yeah. it's interesting. I'm just going to come back to something with the walking and the running, and or walking, and then I'm going to include running in that because you've got that lovely picture here. Yeah. And I mean, he, he, Michael Johnson, is was such an elegant and is such an elegant man. Um, and he was interviewed some time ago. And um, the person said, it was a sports interview somewhere, and just, the person just said to him, the host said to him, you always look so well poised. And he said, my coach always said to me, when you walk into the room, just lift your breastbone up from behind one inch higher. And then he's got this poise about him. And in, in one of the Olympics, I can't remember which one it was, and he was partly comparing, and he was, into, he was used... Um, uh, I can't remember what was happening, but they were talking about an event that was going on and he was in the box talking about it. And for the first time I heard a world-class athlete say, yes, the problem with these guys is that they're not running with their whole body anymore. Yeah. And I went, yes, because he has got his own, as you pointed out here, his own specific running style. And it was beautiful to watch. And it was amazing to watch. It was so different to everybody else. But, you know, his quality is that he was taught to run with his whole body. Yeah. I don't think they run with their legs, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's all about glute max. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think was it eighteen months ago or something that um, oh god, whose name has gone? Uh, Jamaican runner, world champion. Bolt. Sorry. Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt. Yes. Um, you know there was a the head-on uh, video of him coming off the blocks, and he's like he's just bleeding power. He's like, oh my God, he, he, you know, his glutes aren't doing this and it's all about, well, so he should be tracking sagittally and it's like, shut the heck up about the glutes, but also just look at the anatomy. Yeah. You know, so in, in my mind, it's like, well, you know, one of the, the issues was that his knees weren't going straight ahead and kind of pushing down. They were coming across and then pushing down. Mm -hmm. But well, stop going from the freaking anatomy books and she's mentioned that the very kind of cleaner views that we get and start seeing it in three dimensions yes. in my mind it's like that drive is perfectly oriented to put more load into glute max if you want to isolate it out to yeah. assist with the drive down so it's not, oh. he's found his own way to get that power from mm -hmm. his techniques yeah if we take a glute max off the body, which we do in dissection sometimes, they are all different consistencies and thicknesses. So of course, if you saw the shape of it in situ, and then you removed his body from it, but kept the foot and the connection through the leg attached, you would see that the pathway around the glute max would be different to the way that the outside viewer is looking at it. And he's found it from within. Yep. Boom. And it gets that result. Quite remarkable. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes, but you know, again, I'm sure Stephen would have many things to say about the imposition of biomechanical books on the biomechanics of a movement. Yeah. Um, it's like, well, 
we have to see the see the anatomy in the context. That's yeah. where your, your work with the, the dissection would be so much so of so much help to be able to assist with that, that visualization. It's been interesting coming from the you know being a movement person as well and manual therapy. And I'm glad I did it that way round really. Um, but um, and I never really intended to ever become a manual therapist um, at all. You know, I just but I had a feeling for it when I used to be a competitive cyclist. I just wanted to learn what it was like to sort of massage because it was useful for our own legs. And I just thought well, that's a nice thing to do. And I was a teenager then. I, si I sent off for a massage course. It was a Swedish massage course. Came came back with a piece of paper. It was those orange A4 photocopied folded piece of paper through the post. It was 350 pounds, and I barely had three pounds fifty for my name at that age. Um, but I knew that this was going to be interesting to me, but I let it go for a long time. But um, where are we going to go with that? It was, um, that's right, the, the dissection work has, has shown me something about shape. And that was something that really opened up for me the first ever time I dissected. And there was a, a quote from Van der Scarabelli's that she would always say, going with the body and not against it. And, you know, it's what you're talking about in what you're looking at in someone walking, you know, someone's walking pattern, how that might extend into running how you figure it out our own way once we can learn to feel for ourselves. So what I was met with was just the landscape under the skin. Mm -hmm. And there it was. And I just thought, if I move following the landscape, I'm not going to have a problem. No. But if I go against the landscape, I'm going to run into all sorts of issues because I'm trying to put the square peg into the round hole. Yeah. Yeah. It's really refreshing to hear you say that's what you're doing with the, the walking stuff as well. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to trying to give a give a, a blueprint and understanding of vocabulary, you know, visual as much as, as verbal. Um, but, well, can can we recognise the, the qualities and also can we can we match it up um, with the, the vocabulary that we do have? Because again, the, my head is in the, the lecture I'm giving later. So we ha we we've got force length curves, and we've got um, force speed curves, and we've got uh, fascial elasticity curves, mm -hmm. and they they get taught as separate subjects. It's like okay, so for this hour we're going to talk about oh, isometric contractions and force length curve and, and whatever. It's like well, actually, whenever you put all of that story together and start seeing the the, the way in which we move, so all of the, the uh, I know Robert Slipe kind of made it kind of popular, the idea of the elasticity within tendons. Well, actually, that helps with the power amplification of the the muscles to stay close to isometric. And, and I, I know there's a resistance in kind of some, some fields of our work to the biomechanics. I think that's, that's, that's the fault. There's kind of two faults. It's the fault of biomechanics, not tying up the story. Yeah. And it's, it's also our in it sometimes resistance to science it's like oh being there done that struggle with it um, through school it was boring didn't like it couldn't do it don't give me a graph don't certainly don't give me a bloody equation um, and i think it, again it was just badly taught yeah yeah it's like well if we you know i think tom we talked about this in, in order to understand the system you know, he would always talk about in order to do a good first session you have to have done a 12th session but you can't do a 12 session until you've done the first session. But you're, so your first, just accept it, your first session could be rubbish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> until you've done a 12 session. And, but your 12, first 12 session, it's only really going to be rubbish, because, but it's going to be better because you've got the context of the, the others. But, so you have to go through it. You have to see the whole system in order to know where the bits fit. Totally, totally. Um, it's not somewhere, but it? <laughs> it's got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and I, mean, I wish physics had to start with the, the metaphysics. <laughs> you know, let's look at the universe. Let's look at you know, let's look at the moon. Let's look at the whatever. Let's look at gravity, and then it's like, give me the bits. Yeah, my dad was he was into that when I was young, so I'm kind of lucky in that way. I, I think you know I've got him to thank for that way of thinking because he started there. So he would have conversations with me about that when I was nine. I used to cry myself to sleep trying to get to the end of an endless universe. You know and. It was great. It wasn't for, it wasn't trauma. It was just like, where, how, how can something be endless? What, what is this thing? And are we that tiny then? You know, and then it just, I got really into physics when I was at school then and it made a lot of sense to me. So James, you're, you're also, is it, you're going through a master's right now, is that right? I've I finished master's. Right. Okay. So what is it you're working on? Okay. 
sorry, I kind of cut out a little bit there. Yeah, so um, one of the few times that we've met, you've been studying yeah. and been part of uni in a way. So what is it that you've been studying and working with? So I, I need to take time out from the travel and teaching. I kind of burnt myself out from just a, 10 years of kind of constant traveling. And I'm a, I'm a natural introvert, uh, so it takes a lot of energy to stand in front of a room and you know, entertain and whatever. Hopefully, <laughs> um, And I thought, I, I actually also, I have no street cred to actually stand here, you know, degree in psychology, and you know, I've got a training in aromatherapy. I've got, you know, got a few certificates in there. Um, so why not take some time out? And the only people that I found that answer or talk the same language as I wanted to know in terms of movement and the understanding of biomechanics were actually the paleoanthropologists. So, because, you know, I remember uh, years ago reading, oh, there was a paper that said, oh, so whenever you, when you look at the talus, of this species, um, you know, the fossil species, you can tell that this was a tree climber. I'm like, oh, hold on. So from the shape of a talus, you can tell me exactly what this thing was doing with the rest of its body? Because <laughs> that's, that's not what I ever hear whenever I go to you know, physiotherapy style biomechanics lectures. Mm. I get a lot about the talus and the range of motion at the ankle joint and the symbiosis and blah, blah, blah of that local area. And um, so I, I have always had an interest in evolution. And I eventually I Googled every so often to find a, a master's program. I found one up in, in New York that kind of ticked to so many boxes of, of looking at a big question in, in paleoanthropology is the question of shape. Which sounds like shape whenever I said, but shape was in squares and rectangles. And, uh, yeah. Because they had to interpret from a shape what, what's the capabilities of that, that area, what's the capabilities of the rest of that structure. But also, if you find 16 taluses, it's like which talus belongs to which species? So I've got this talus, and I think it belongs to a chimpanzee. But there's a lot of fantastic math that just kind of blows my mind, um, and you know, I can't do. But on being able to analyze shape, so the shape is a it's a, it's a huge question in paleoanthropology, and um, so I, I ventured into um, two years. I did a, did it uh, part time, so it was actually a one year program, and um, where we went through so human evolutionary anatomy, functional anatomy, but it was not the functional anatomy I would have had with Gary Gray. Um, and so evolution primates, so primate movement, movement strategies, and then a lot of computer modeling, which I know is not everyone's kind of thing, but whenever you actually get into it, it's really quite a potentially powerful tool in being able to understand. So the, the dissertation that I had to do was looking at why the femur is curved. So because do you have one? You just one you prepared earlier? <laughs> yeah, there's a so you know, there's an anterior posterior curve, yeah. and the standard story for that curvature is that it it produces predictability of loading. So if you were to press that femur, it would bend in the same way, and that is the textbook standard answer to that question. And my my head of department, are you familiar with me, uh, Armin Neil Alexander? Yes. Yeah. So you know, he, he died, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. But huge in, in uh, early research of biomechanics and tendon elasticity. So my head of department skipped his medical lectures to go into Emil Alexander's lectures at the University of Leeds back in the day. And you know, he, he's investigated, he's a, a world leader in geometric, morphometrics, and just shape analysis. And he went, well, what do you do, James? It's like, because you know, I'm not his normal student. I'm, like, I'm, I'm about 35 years older. And I, oh, I teach this, and it's kind of you know, interesting. He went, hmm. He's working with another guy who said, whenever we load long bones at their kind of regular optimal rate, they don't bend. 
they actually go under compression. So there's no bending whatsoever. There's no tension. So if you bend, it creates tension on one side, compression on the other. Because if, the, if you keep loading that bone in that curve, it means you just get more and more building of bone. The bone has to build to protect itself. It's just, it's a crazy textbook idea. So my dissertation was looking at, well, if, you, if we can create a computer model to kind of simulate the, the, the loads, can we show that the, the femur is actually optimally designed to go under compression? And from a you know, kind of global tensegrity kind of idea, that's kind of exciting. Yeah, really, really. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the description of it might be a little bit dumb, but <laughs> the overall implication of it yeah, definitely. And, you know, given the field that we're in as well, it's, um, you know, it is exciting. I mean, something that has really intrigued me about, this was a process actually of um, teaching to a group of Pilates teachers with Tanner Jones years and years ago up in Edinburgh. And the point I was trying to make is what I'm doing there is holding that by that um, Mesa Tricanta there. And you see how it hangs yeah. you put it at the bottom of your screen. It's just at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. and I, the skeleton they had, I wanted to try and make that point to the students because this is hanging a certain way. The skeleton they had had elastic fittings, so if I cut it, I would ruin their skeleton. But the person's husband that owned the studio was a carpenter, so we went into his shed and made a femur out of wood, screwed a golf ball to the top end, and yeah. I really structured this end, so we drew it onto a piece of four by two. But when I held it here, it didn't hang like that it hung straight down. And what I had missed was here. Uh -huh. So that medial condyle gone. So yeah. we had just nail a block of wood onto the inside so it hung in that, in that line. And I realized every bump and its mass means that it hangs in space perfectly. So if, if we can feel it at that level, you're moving yeah. through your bones, the tissues are gonna follow. Yeah. You know, it was that, that was just one of the biggest eye-opening moments for me. And I just went back into that teaching room and thought, I've got no idea where we're going to go today, but this is what yeah. I've just discovered. Yeah, there's a, there's a meaning and a purpose to every line, groove, bump, Absolutely. projection, protrusion, you know, whatever. There are there is, you, know, you mentioned the, the learning to move process from as a kid. It's like, how many bones are in a kid's body? It's like, well, practically none. <laughs> cartilage it's like they're, they're mostly just little balls of water but it's a they self-organize they self-organize through and you know and this is one of the frustrations of bad biomechanics it's like you know it is the biomechanics that organize the body you've just got a rubbish story and you know it will get better as it, as the language improves the forces acting through the body help to optimize the system well, and but optimize according to your movement strategy. So if you move in an interesting way, you're going to have an interesting anatomy. Yes. And, you know, and if you have an interesting anatomy because of some deviation, then you're going to have a, an interesting movement strategy. And um, you know, it's it's a two way street kind of into a relationship. And um, with uh, you know the, the fascial art piece that was done in the fashion project, um, that. Uh, when, when we look at the gluteus maximus, for instance, you know, the amount of connection that it has to the fascia lata, bearing the amount of connection that it has towards the periosteum, is far greater to the fascia lata. And a quote that you used, I think, at the first British Fascia Symposium um, was perhaps a tensor fascia lata maximus. Yep. You know, and when you look at it that way, um, and I've got some footage of those actually moving, I'll actually send that to you so you've got that. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite remarkable because that is exactly what it is. And then it describes the movement completely differently rather than Bruce Maximus. You know, it's a different thing then. And yes. more, I mean, it's great to consider it that way. And it, it takes a, 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 a lateral thinker to really see it like that. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, that's, um, that's very much part of the Vleeming's posterior oblique sling. Yeah. So, you know, even you know, tying things up, coming back to, uh, Sprinter guy, you see both, yeah, got it that time. Um, <laughs> that cross patterning, so you know, as one knee's coming through, the other arm's kind of forward, so you're getting, you know, it's not just posterior um, 
tensor of the fascia lata, it's the um, thoracic lumbar fascia, latissimus torsi, all helping kind of tension through that, that, that sling. So that's, you know, again, part of my argument of just look at the anatomy and, sorry, look at the movement, look at the, take the skin off, see that first layer, see its integrity and continuities and angles and, and it's like, oh, it starts to kind of tie up all of these kind of loose threads or empty boxes or whatever kind of makes a metaphor you want to put in. That's brilliant. James, we could be doing this for about another two hours, I think. So we have sure. a lot of time here. Um, so first of all, where can people find you? Where, where would they connect if they need to find you? Um, I'm available on uh, borntomove.com. Uh, and then Instagram and Facebook, all the usuals, uh, Born to Walk or Born to Move. Um, I mean, that's kind of ugly transition from one brand to another. Um, so on there, and then the second edition has just kind of, you know, the brilliant timing. Um, second edition just been released, so that is available not on Amazon at the moment. Uh, they seem to be messing up their supply lines, uh, but is available through Book Depository. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's a, I think, a, I, I describe it as a, it's a, you know, a, every second edition or every next edition should be an, an improvement. I, I, I truly believe that this one, this one is. It's a much more honest, up-to-date, so a lot of the, the stuff that I've learned from the, from the master's degree is kind of in there. I have some new, I was going to say, and some more recent research yeah, yeah. and changes in, in the language. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. I mean, excited what will come from you from that as well, because you have got such a wonderful way of putting that together and seeing it and you've got the patience to do it at the same time you know so um, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, the other thing is that you know you and i sometimes we do some talks at body worlds together which hopefully good yeah. body world stay in london will continue to do that um and uh james and i are doing something next year for Tracy kiernan and we're doing a, a webinar next week although i'm not sure this might not go out before that <laughs> Um, but next, I think in April, we're doing something up north with Tracy Kiernan. Yes. And we're yes. just doing all sorts of lectures and workshops, whether it be online or with various um, schools, but you'll probably find that by connecting with James anyway. Yeah, I was just trying to find the dates, and I can't find the dates at the moment. But, the 21st um, of April, something like that. Something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, so I just did my webinar with her this morning, so that's yeah. kind of gone yeah. on. So. Mine's going to be next, next Wednesday, which I've got to figure out, yeah. But um, James, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting. We need to do a part two, I think, at some point. So um, absolutely, with Guinness in hand this time. Definitely. So thanks, James Earls. Thank you.